Richard Feynman, the late great physicist, said his father used to read to him from the encyclopedia. He would sit him in his lap, uh, I think he was a child at the time, and he would read about dinosaurs, for instance. And when he got to a fact like, this dinosaur attained a length of so many feet, he would stop and he'd say, you know what that means? That means if this dinosaur was standing in our front yard and you looked out the window of your second floor bedroom, you would be looking him right in the eyes. He took those bare facts and he translated them into what they really mean. And that hit me like an analogy I haven't come up with yet. <laughs> I resonated with it because that's what I do. And I'm not a scientist. I'm just a collection of atoms arranged into a system of sensors and actuators attached to a processor. <laughs> What I mean is, all my life, the only thing I've ever felt like I was really programmed to do is take in data, put it through the processor, and see what comes out. And it might be a joke, or a poem, or a colorful science explanation. Isn't that what poets and artists do? They show us what the world really means to them, what it looks like through their eyes. And comedians, they'll take something that we've all seen and thought nothing of and surprise us with how funny it is if you look at it from just the right angle. So Vincent Van Gogh and Maya Angelou, Freddie Mercury and George Carlin, they each had their own way of looking at the world. And life, my life, is better because they shared the view through their lens. And you don't have to be an artist or a scientist to have a viewpoint worth sharing. Um, the more angles, the better, really, right? Now, I do identify as a comedian, but nowadays I spend a lot of time helping scientists communicate with the public, and this Feynman story has become some of my favorite advice. So by all means, tell us the facts, but don't stop there. For example, The International Space Station orbits the Earth at 17,500 miles an hour, which sounds fast, but that's a number that's so outside our daily experience. What if I told you that's almost five miles per second? And that means if you were in space and the ISS went by, in one second, it would be five miles away. That's what 17,500 miles per hour really doesn't convey at all. Right? Or Pangea, 200 million years ago, instead of this sad state of affairs where we're divided into seven separate continents, <laughs> there was one unified landmass like this red carpet I'm confined to. <laughs> And it was called Pangea. Well, you know what that means? International travel was really easy. <laughs> you want to go to Germany? It's right over here. Come on. Amsterdam? Uh, I'm an American, and I love to travel, but I've never seriously considered living in another country until recently. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm not sure that's something we should be applauding. We are cursed to live in these interesting times, maybe a little too interesting, right? I wish continental drift was the only thing trying to separate us. When I heard the theme of today's program, Constellate, my first thought was gravity, obviously. <laughs> right? <laughs> Actually, my first thought was, what? <laughs> is that even a real word? What is? <laughs> I think you made that up. And I know all words are made up. <laughs> but Constellate is a real word. It's in the dictionary, but nowhere else. No one's ever used it in a sentence. It means to form or cause to form into a cluster or group, to gather together, like gravity. Gravity has been bringing things together for billions of years. It's the grand unifier. And some people might say, gravity brings me down. But the way I see it, gravity is bringing us together. It grounds us. Where would we be without gravity? Or somewhere. <laughs> Constellate comes from the Latin word stella, which means star, which is perfect, because without gravity, we wouldn't even have stars or starlight. We wouldn't have 
the sun or sunlight. Because gravity, do you know this? I think by now maybe a lot of us have heard this. In the early universe, shortly after the Big Bang, there was really only a few elements dispersed throughout an expanding universe. And really, it was mostly hydrogen. And you can't really do much with that. It would have been a really boring universe. Imagine trying to build a sandwich and all you have is bread. Or say you want to build a wall. <laughs> but you only have mortar and no bricks. Well, just add gravity and the results are amazing. It's like sea monkeys or those little dinosaurs you drop in the water and they expand, right? Just add gravity to the early universe and it starts gathering up, it starts constellating all the hydrogen in the universe and it starts forming stars. And so you've heard this, right? Stars are factories that produce all the higher elements. Those are the building blocks of everything, everything, right? You and me included. So I first heard this, like a lot of people, from Carl Sagan on Cosmos. And I got so excited, I just wanted to shout it to the world. I wanted to just like go door to door. Have you heard the gospel of Carl? <laughs> Yeah, these atoms were forged in stars. We're celestial beings, pass it on. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry if I woke you. <laughs> and not only that, in the process of making the elements, almost as an afterthought, stars release all this uh, leftover energy, right? And uh, that energy, especially in the case of our star, this is energy that they wrung out of hydrogen atoms. And here on the Earth, that star, that light, that sunlight, is what powers all life on Earth, right? Because green plants capture sunlight, they convert it into a chemical energy, and that's the foundation of the food chain. So a cow eats the grass, a man eats the cow, a mosquito eats a little bit of the man, a frog eats the mosquito, a snake eats the frog, a bird eats the snake, and a woman eats the bird. And it just goes on and on like that. Energy is never destroyed, it's only converted. It's just passed on and on like a game of telephone. So when you eat an apple or a cheeseburger, you get energy from it and you use it to power your brain and to power your heart, to move your arms and legs. And if you use some of it to flap your vocal cords, you produce a vibration in the air. And that sound wave is energy, and it's the same energy. Your voice is sunshine, and so is mine. <laughs> it sounds like poetry, but it's true. Me and you and you and you, we are made of star stuff. And isn't that enough? Some people think science is boring and astrophysics so esoteric and irrelevant to our lives here on Earth. But be, by studying the stars, we discovered our own origin story, and it's a blockbuster, right? Because of biology, we've learned that everything on all life here on Earth is related. And because of physics, we've learned that Life is just made from the very same stuff as the rest of the universe. So we're not separate in any way from the universe. We're a part of the universe that has gained consciousness. To Carl Sagan, that meant we're a way for the cosmos to know itself. Ooh. When I hear that, I think the human race is like a global multi-camera production with seven billion cameras documenting the human condition from seven billion angles. That sounds like a pretty good show. Prime time. For our final shot, we'll dissolve to the lens of paleontology. Through paleontology, we've learned that birds are dinosaurs, not just related to dinosaurs or descended from dinosaurs, but today, dinosaurs, birds, are categorized as avian theropod dinosaurs, right? So, just like Pluto is no longer a planet, sorry, it's really not accurate to say that dinosaurs are extinct because there are 10,000 living species of dinosaur today. They're on every continent and their diversity is beautiful. We have tiny hummingbirds that weigh less than a penny and a 300 pound ostrich that stands nine feet tall. It can't quite peer into your second store bedroom window, but uh, I'm okay with that. <laughs> We have peacocks and penguins, murmurations of starlings, 
carrion eaters and birds of prey. The bald eagle, the symbol of our nation, is a dinosaur. And so is Donald Duck and Tweety Bird and the Roadrunner. Corvids are clever tool-using dinosaurs. Parrots are talking dinosaurs. Blackbirds singing in the dead of night, that's a song about a dinosaur. And I know why the caged dinosaur sings. Here's how not extinct dinosaurs are. Most mornings when I wake up, the first thing I hear is the cries of dinosaurs outside my dwelling. I get up, I have dinosaur eggs for breakfast. I go out to my car and a dinosaur has desecrated my car. Dinosaurs pooping on buildings is such a problem today that we have an entire industry that makes these countermeasures. You know what they're called? Bird spikes. Ooh. Or pigeon spikes if you need to single somebody out. <laughs> on Thanksgiving, almost every non-vegetarian in America eats the same dinosaur for dinner. <laughs> Colonel Sanders built an empire on his recipe for fried dinosaur parts. <laughs> so we know what dinosaur tastes like. It tastes like chicken. <laughs> and turkey and duck, and if somebody has a small appetite, we say she eats like a bird. How did the bird become the standard of eating light? Photosynthesis is eating light. <laughs> we live in a time when a dark energy is pushing us apart, but gravity is an attractive force with a beautiful message. No matter what you're made of, no matter who you are, it just wants to bring us all together so we can shine like a star. Thank you. <laughs>